to our first ever outside broadcast, Author Hub on Tour, brought to you with the support of our colleagues at Clockwork Medical. So I've been sent to Coventry as we come to you from the University of Warwick. You notice I don't have my trusty sidekick Pete Bates with me, but he's been massively upgraded, and our guests today are Tim Spaulding, Pete Thompson, Sanjay Anand and Henry Burke. Pete was only ever holding me back. Um, I'm delighted I can finally talk about some proper orthopaedics as we're at the sports knee surgery meeting. So congratulations to you, Tim, Pete and Andy Metcalf on hosting another fantastic meeting. It really was all killer, no filler. Thank you. Yeah. This is my second time at the meeting, and the one thing I would say is it's always genuinely been the best faculty in the world for sports knee. It's been stellar. And a particular highlight for me today was the heavy focus on the video surgical techniques. Um, video is something we're keen on at Hub. We've got some surgical approach videos coming. Now that it's over and you can breathe, what are your reflections of the day? You know what, there's always so much to learn in knee surgery and we, we run these meetings, I meet people abroad and, and then we can invite them to come and share their knowledge with us and yet again this time there's still more knowledge comes out and there's um, so many more things we can do. The knee is not dead as it were, we can still, so many more techniques, new instrumentation, so that's really appealing. I think all the speakers from my point of view, they delivered, they made their videos. Uh, we, we tried to make this uh, heavy on the, the how and why so to show techniques of it so there's a resource for people to be able to look at afterwards and to cover that, that sort of more no novel aspect of, a, of an education meeting. But people seem to enjoy finally being at a meeting. It was nice to be face to face finally with everyone and catching up with people. And uh, as I say, the approach and the, the focus on surgical approaches in the video was fantastic. Yeah, congratulations because we sort of ride on Tim's coattails oh, a bit wow. with it because Tim's got the contacts globally and that's why the faculty is so good. Were you happy that the surgical side got covered um, yeah I think I think we can look back at some of the video the bit nitty-gritty of, of how you have to do something I'm gonna have to look at a couple of the talks again to really to play it through in slow time to understand exactly what was what was done and some of the real the, the bits it's like where people position their retractors what position they're using mm -hmm. and it's like, like on the osteochondral one two Z retractors to yeah. expose yeah I learned that, at a, that actually, when I'm glad they were doing it because I've seen that and that works. They get your hands out of the way, it's not just a, a Langenbeck retractor. So the Z retractors, mm. um, Zimmer Z retractors, you, they made it for the mini incision knees and then they just, everything's out of the way. Yeah? Your assistant's not getting annoyingly in the way. So those little bits that I quite like from these things. Plus there's this format of it being available online. You know, that's a brilliant thing for right. a week or two weeks afterwards. People can then go back and digest what was said in the talks. Yeah, for sure. Because it can be quite a fast four minute uh, video. Pete, I, it's a fantastic programme, but um, I'm afraid I missed the first talk of the day. I was a, it was a late night last night and it was yours. You, you missed the best talk. Uh, yeah. Did I miss much? Uh, you missed the clicker not actually working. Okay. So yeah, it's always, you, you always feel a bit of a muppet going yeah. first and the clicker wouldn't work. Um, yeah, Jonathan's talk actually on trochleoplasty was brilliant. It's a lovely little video he did. He's really stuck to the brief and just did a video and it was really good to actually see his technique of how, it, how he does it. Um, we sort of didn't have that much time for discussion and mm. um, maybe the way I do an MPFL reconstruction is slightly different to other people. It might have been quite nice to have a bit of a challenge on that and a bit more discussion about it. Do, can you summarise your technique for me? Well, I mean, so what graft are you using? Gracilis? Gracilis. And okay. you know, there was a bit of discussion actually that you missed that was interesting about synthetics and other grafts and mm. you know the bottom line is you don't need anything that's so strong to, to do an MPFL reconstruction. Yeah. So it's a gracilis tendon graft passed through an oblique tunnel. People should have a look at the videos and see exactly how that is. Okay. So it avoids any need for fixation, any hardware on the patella. Right. Um, and have so you ever ever had a fracture with that? I've had a bony one, bridge fracture. Um, like genuinely only ever one but mm. because of uh, there was that little first video showing the dissection as you peel the soft tissue off the patella. And that's a really key part of the technique because if you do have a bone bridge fracture, you can still, you've still got a trough that you lay the graft yeah. into and you just suit the soft tissues over the top and it's still stable. You just yeah. need to go a bit slower with the, with the rehab. Um, so uh, the, a lot of MPFL reconstruction, like many things we do, very industry driven. Yeah. You use this device and that device. And and I, you I, just don't, don't need to. No, and I mean, my technique is gracilis, but I put two anchors in the, in the patella. And so you're just you're lining up two tunnels and just passing it through. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Right. One of the tunnels is right on the side wall, just over halfway down, and one's on the front of the patella, and then you can easily pass the graft through and you get fantastic fixation, strong cortical bone bridge. And and just to give us an idea, how often are you doing isolated MPFL? How many times are you adding in a tip tubal osteotomy? 
Yeah, that's an interesting one because I, I remember the first sports knee meeting that I was involved with was 2000 and uh, what was it five probably when I was mm -hmm. was it 2005 yeah. when I started yeah. and um, and I did a talk on MPFL reconstruction you thought I was mad nobody nobody had ever heard of it in this country because I'd just learned it in Australia I mm. got back from um, uh, from from fellowship and I suppose I then started talking a bit about MPFL and my sort of take on things at the time was try and only do one operation right. you know fix the most abnormal part of the anatomy and I must admit, I've come around to other people's thoughts on this, particularly the French guys who were a bit, you know, David David Dejour with his ala carte bit. Yeah. And, yeah, it's, it's actually quite rare now that I do that. I think we recognise patella alta much more. And uh, most of the patellofemoral surgery I do now is, um, is combined procedures. Right. It's difficult to know whether part of that's referral pattern as well, because, of course, you get sent... Yeah, you know more complex cases, don't you, in different cases? But I suspect actually it's because we, you know, I, we, we I particularly recognised patella alta much more than I did, probably a bit ignorant to it before. And if there's no alta, but the TTD, TTTG is up, are you just medial, are you medializing often? Yeah, again, no. Um, right. Really, very. Uh, can barely remember the last time I did just a direct medialization. So ultra is your main indication for an yeah. tuber tubercle yeah. osteotomy. And, and as you distalize, you do medialize it a bit, and yeah. you can you can add in more medialization. Um, yeah. But it's pretty pretty rare actually. Okay. Um, and the the trochleoplasty bit, um, I was giving Chris Wilson a hard time because at the osteotomy meeting um, earlier in the year, he made some throwaway comment that trochleoplasty was an inelegant operation you know yeah. compared to his osteotomy of dividing several bones you know but mm. um i tried to pick him up on that and it is the more i do trochleoplasty um the more i think it's a fantastic operation it really is for the right people not saying everybody needs it if you've got a domed trochlea there is nothing that is going to make your patella sit in the groove more yeah. than actually creating a groove yeah unless you've got significant patella alta yeah, but even if you've True. got a significant patellar alta, you pull it down a bit, you're only going to pull it down, what, a couple of centimetres. You're yeah. still not in a maximum, you know, normally. You still may not that. be in the groove. It's, still so I, groove I've gone the other way. In. I've got the other, the other patellofemoral stuff. So I will do the trochleoplasty at the end if everything else has been done. It's tracking well, the height's good, yeah. it's engaging the groove inflection. If they're still disc then, then that's the one for the trochleoplasty. So there's only one going yeah. early with those. But we're doing, like, we're doing more and more distalisation than, than we ever have done. Certainly, I've started doing more of those. If we move on to the, um, I think that's more than enough talk about trochleoplasty. No one needs to know any more than that. Um, other than just refer them to Pete. Send them to Pete Thompson. Yeah, um, we'll get Jonathan, his. Jonathan Jonathan. We'll put his mobile Jonathan's number on the screen. The, the, yeah. The <laughs> Can I, um, Henry? I'm going to ask you about quads tendon. We had two really good uh, ten e videos from the US on on quads tendon harvest. And every time I go to an international meeting, it's all they talk about: mm. quad, quad, the quad. Mm. It's not a graft I ever use. Have you used it? Yeah, I've, I've, I've done a few um, just recently and uh, I've been quite pleased with it. One of the things you'll notice if you do use it is that it looks like a dog's dinner when you string it out. Yeah. We're used to these beautiful hamstring shiny things that shiny, look like smooth, a ligament. Just like and you will get something that looks like a dog's dinner and you think, God, I've made a right hash of that. But yeah. then you feel it and think, actually, that feels pretty good. So when, what's um, your indication for taking a quad tendon? Revision, mostly. Yeah. Um, but are you taking with a bone block? With a bone block, with a bone block. <clears throat> and it's it's one of the things that I was talking about earlier was I really like the fact that there is an option of either the bone block or no bone block. Mm -hmm. So you can take soft tissue or you can take it with a bone block. And for revision, the bone block is very helpful because often in the tibial side you've got a big hole, particularly yeah. if there's been a biocomposite screw in there, and you can put it either way up. But in revision, the tibial side in in primary, I will use it on the femoral side. Um, why, why not go to BTB for your revision if you want bone blocks? The, the trouble is, I, I, I was trained to do hamstrings. All, all the consultants I worked for as a trainee were all hamstrings, and yeah. so that was naturally the progression I went to. Um, BTB, the, the anterior knee pain has always worried me. It, it really has, and I think that people that kneel, um, and there are lots of people that kneel for lots of different reasons, that, and I think that they're, the anterior knee pain is a, it can, and can be a problem, and I've worried about that always, because yeah. I think if you give someone lifelong anterior knee pain who, who works on their knees, for example, I think that's a big problem. Yeah. Well, this conversation I have with Andy Williams is that if you're treating professional athletes and them getting back three months earlier, there's a difference between playing in 
a euro is getting a new contract extension. That's a risk they're prepared to take. But if you're treating Joe public, then think that, about... That's exactly right. And uh, I've, I've become quite good friends with Don Shelbourne, Mr. B BTB. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> his results are incredible. And I would love to be able to replicate them. But his setup, I went to visit him in Indianapolis, <clears throat> is incredible. He's got nine full-time physical therapists um, for his practice and his, his junior partner. And yeah, the, the results are incredible, but I think it's, that is not transferable to the UK. Yeah. And I think the rehabs are worried. But the, the, the few quads I have done, I've been very impressed with how quickly the wound heals and how quickly they get their power back. And I think it's a good graph because, it, as I say, there are options. It's also very reliable. When you open that bit of tissue, there's a huge amount of collagen there that you can, is, you can yeah. take. Well, we, learned, we, we learned today there's like a 20-case learning curve mm -hmm. and then that you don't have to take bone. That, and then you don't have to worry about if you've gone full thickness. Yeah. When I started with them, you're thinking this is a heinous crime to actually dare to go into the joint. But then we saw John um, X. Yeah. Zeroyans. <laughs> um, he his, his talk was really good. <laughs> he went full yeah. thickness. And if you can yeah. just do that, and then you get a short graft. And then the key for me has been the, the suturing bit. And if, he's got, if it's worked out now with a sutured device that will adapt, attach to it, mm. and a fixation that won't stretch, then your soft tissue becomes easier. And why take bone? If you that works. Don't worry about the, the soft tissue fixation and the small amount of graft well, within a tunnel. So he was they're only looking at a centimetre and a half yeah. of, of So he's talking about six, six and a half in total. Five millimetres. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, you, most of the healing is going to be around the aperture. That's yeah. where the strength is going to be. But he's not, fixing it, with a, he's not fixing it with a, uh, a screw, though, is he? He's fixing no. it with well, that's what I wanted to ask him. He's taken the stiffest graft. And then he's put two bungees on either side, and yeah. it's slightly well, that's the, the object. Well, that's the worry, that it is soft tissue will stretch and the bone bit. But if you've got a construct that is bone and soft tissue at the other end, that's equivalent to soft tissue. It's a soft tissue fixation. Mm. Just the fact that, because one end is soft fixation, it's going to mm. stretch. But, I mean, the fact he's done 1,400 cases is just well, quite remarkable, isn't and it? And it's great when he dropped that in. Published. And he's yeah. collected it, yeah. But, I've got to say, I've not used quite... I've, I've just been a big patella tendon fan yeah. and, I, and I don't see the, uh, the anterior knee pain it's, it's based on the very old data that isn't it where it was an open <coughs> operation you'd cut the fat pad and retract and, and yeah. you, you do it now without touching that fat pad it's very rarely breached I think the, the anterior knee pain is actually a lot less now and certainly on the wards post up my hamstring patients I probably have more discomfort than my patella tendons really I was going to ask you because um, Julian Feller did a really nice video on patella tendon harvest yeah. So most, still, I'd, I think it's fair to say most majority of people in the UK don't use patella tendon as a primary graft. For me, I probably use it about ten percent of the time. I'm, I use hamstrings predominantly. Have you got any tips then for harvesting? Uh, I, I, there, there are a few. I do, do it through an anteroidal portal. So you've got to manoeuvre in the femoral blocking can be difficult. So I keep the femoral block quite small. So tw in, in, twenty mils max length on the femoral okay. on the patella side, nine mils width. And you then, that five mils makes a difference when you've got to get it into your femoral tunnel yeah. Yeah. And, and hyperflex. Do you use a, a jig on the patella? Because I was interested to see that, that, that it was he didn't cut it freehand and he did that yeah. sort of, um, it's sort of coronal, coronal plane yeah. cut, yeah. which looked a bit scary. So that's the thing I'm nervous got, about. Jig. I like the jig on the patella. The yeah. Comrade jig, yeah. yeah, that gives you jig, a 10 mm. I just do it freehand. Do you? Do freehand. So can I ask a question? You've, you've got, obviously, you've got your longitudinal saw cuts. You, you've measured your 9 millimeters. Yeah. You're going to measure your 20 mil length and you're going to go straight up. Across at the top. So it's, it's like a bullet. Yeah, so, it's yeah, so you are slightly. tapering the top. Yeah. And I actually angle it in slightly. You can do that coronal cut to make it thinner. Yeah. I end up with quite a thin bone block. And I prefer the bit that's next to the, the tendon in the femoral socket to be flat with the tendon. Right. So when you put it into the socket, you've got a big a round tunnel and a flat bit of bone. Your screw will go in easily. Which what, Your bone is anterior on the femoral Your bone socket. is posterior. There's a hole superior to it. So the, the bone block is flat in the round tunnel. You've then got space with your screw to almost push it in the first, yeah, okay. the first hole, thread, yeah. Yeah. and then so you don't worry about damaging the graft when you put your screw in. So keep it, keep it flat as it, in that tendon half of, it, of the bone. And then on the tibial side, what, what length? Is it you can go as you can go as long as you want on there. So yeah. if I've got somebody who's got a, a short graft and I want a longer graft, I will often take 30 yes. mils on that tibia and not worry about. It. I actually bone graft the patella defect not the tibial defect that was demoed in yeah, the video. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. That is yeah. this the patella that's it's the cosmetic bit, and that's yeah. the anterior knee pain bit. So one of the reasons people are nervous about using BTB is often you get a little mismatch of your graph length and you can have a bit of bone on your tibial side that's either too long 
yeah. or it's too short. Have you got any tips for kind of ma managing that? Yeah, you've got, to, uh, you've got to go into it with a plan beforehand. You've got to get, get your measurements done. Um, usually an average about 45 tibial tunnel and a 25 to 30 femoral tunnel will usually seat most. If you've got a really big patellar alta, you can sometimes either create, if you've, got, if you've put it in and you've got the tibial bone block stuck out completely, you can create a trough in the tibia and insert the block down and just fix it with a screw or a staple. Okay. And N plus seven, it's the, it's yeah. the second, N thing, plus seven, second yeah. thing I ever learned. No, you taught me that. N plus, it's the Tell us, explain, well, explain, N, N plus N plus explain this. If you have the bone uh, system that was 25, it was built on the 25 bone plugs each end, okay. and then your N is the length of the tendon part of the graft. Right. And N plus seven is the angle you put the jig. Set the jig out. So right. if it's a That's 45 millimeter graft length, then it's yeah. N plus seven is 52 degrees, provided the top of the jig is horizontal to the tibia, and then Jeez. it works. So if your graft is 100, 105 long total, then that's a worry. That's going to be a long graft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to have a 55 length of tendon. And if you've just done your 45 degree slope, your bone plug will very likely poke out the bottom. So that's a way of, of um, spotting it. <coughs> so N plus seven gets you vaguely in the ballpark. Okay. Why, why can't you just put an interference screw in with a soft tissue into your tunnel if it's too long? Yeah, you can. You can, you can just waste the off. bone block, don't you? Well, yeah. okay. but there's another trick of, of folding, folding it, the bone yeah. block over and suturing it. But, I mean, you'd, you'd have to be very long for that. And but that's, you just drill your femoral socket a bit deeper as well, so yeah. you've got another five mil. I think the concern more is if, if you're short on the tibial side and, and then you're putting your screw onto sutures. Maybe that's... I think some people are nervous about that. If you're short on the tibial side... That your bone, bone block is gone inside in. the tunnel, mm. oh, tensioning, and you yes. put your screw in, and you, all you've got is stitches. So then you've got your suture still through the bone mm. block, and you put a screw up, which is a bit buried in there, and mm. maybe in soft bone. Then make a small drill hole from where you've done the tibial uh, bone block has come out of the tibia, and then a drill hole and pass your sutures through. So you've tied the sutures which are through the bone plug over that bone bridge mm. to give an extra yeah. backup fixation. Or, or you could use a screw, but then you've got a prominent tibial. screw. Yeah. If you've just made that drill hole, if you've got the yeah. recessed tibial bone plug, you, you, you can see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So then you've tied it off and there's a bit of a, yeah. um, a good night suture. But that, that, that specific scenario so you can sleep well. is yeah. my one and only indication for using a barbs or screw. Right. So you can just put it in and just push it all the way in. Yeah. You don't have to worry about leaving the head on the, on the cortex like a metal screw. Yeah. You just put a short and push it all the way in. Yeah. Uh, and then put and a then post, back, put, and put post yeah. in there. Always back it up. But w one comment that I have to make is um, <clears throat> the graft choice session, or the graft choice, is, is, is a fantastic chat. And actually, you don't really need any starter for the conversation, videos or anything. You get ACL surgeons in a room and get them talking about graft choice. Yeah. It'll go on and on and on. And actually, it is fantastic that we've got these three very good options, clearly. And, you know, you've got options for primary, you've got options for children you've got options for revision mm -hmm. and i think that it is very much tailoring it to but it's patient. a 20 person learning curve and the danish data that spotted on the registry that quads tendon were not doing well this was a funny bit they published that's that. the lind paper Funnished, published that bit that quads tendon not doing so well because they had a higher failure rate and because that wasn't fitting with what everyone wanted to hear they then really analyzed the data yeah, right and found that it was one or two clinics that were making the rogue results. And therefore- They skewed it for everyone. Skewed it for everyone. Once you take those out of the equation, which is always good, delete your bad results, yeah. and then the rest of it looks very good. And finally, you could then see that if you're doing it um, experienced and good, actually it is a good graft. Mm -hmm. So the worry at the beginning that quad tendon was bad, once you'd learned from the learning curve, the data has become cleaner. But that paper had got published and, you've, and Martin Zen I think, that, I think the, the harvest technique is very important for the quads. Yes. More so than probably everything else. The patellar tendon is all straight. Mm -hmm. And you, you meant, yeah, it does look like a dog's dinner when it comes out, doesn't it? And you, you wonder whether some of those collagen fibres you're cutting aren't parallel to the... No, they're not. Do you know? Uh, they're maybe that's, not. that's associated with... Because it's the confluence of four tendons, yeah. isn't mm. it? So it's not going to be. But you, I think... Does that you, matter, though? No, I don't think it does matter. And it's a massive bit of tissue as well. I mean, the, the BTB is a flat ribbon. This thing's a big yeah, yeah. rectangular Fibers block. Fibers the ACL on all parallel, all changing no. the yeah. reflexes as yeah. well. And I must say, it, it is a flat ribbon, though. Yeah. It's a flat ribbon. <laughs> <laughs> Looks just like the patellar tendon. Can we not talk about that? <laughs> yeah, it does, it does. But you know the, um, and the third, that third-generation quads tendon harvester they showed quite good? 
Mm, look very good. I think that's going to save a lot of it. Make it yeah, a little prettier, I think. It's yeah, really I am maybe a ribbon, but the insertion is not. The insertion is not. You see, he took the but bait. The, the functional <laughs> part of it. Is. So I've finally got to show my um, Mohican hairstyle um, uh, illustration recently. That what personal? Your personal one? I haven't seen that, Tim. You, you, the, uh, you will never get. You will never see a Mohican pulling a car with their hair, right? Because you need the whole head of hair, a ponytail, to pull a car. So you need all the strands attached on the femur. So it's not a ribbon with a, just a parallel load of fibers going up into the femur. You need the whole insertion that grips and holds. Likened to a uh, Mohican can't pull it because you're just gonna pull the hair straight out. Hair, right? So you use all the strands That's of your what hair to, to make a ponytail. Yeah. That's, and I finally got to show that recently in a, in a presentation. But the ACL study group. <laughs> no, it was, at, um, it was at Rob LaPrade's meeting. I the mixed virtual course. Did talk. the Americans get that? Well, that, that was the trouble like going. So uh, I, I know today we had this issue that people are, are presenting at the meetings and there's not enough chat to actually say thank you. And I will, will thank all the speakers because they did a fantastic job today. Mm. But then there's this feeling that you've done a talk for a, an international meeting, sent your video in, and there's no sort of feedback or discussion yeah. on what you said. So I don't know if my Mohican talk went down well because I've never heard back. Uh, I heard it was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> it's got around already. Yeah. It? So, so, excellent. Peter Vadonk showed a really nice video about lateral tenodesis. Yeah, yeah, yes. was good. Um, it was quite a slick video, I thought. And he was fixing his, he was making a little, he was taking osteotome to it yes. and then fixing it across that with a staple. Mm. Just curious, what are you guys using? Because I use an anchor. No, I'm learned from, uh, Peter did it that, that way, that he's learned from before as well. Mm. So I am staple, proximal to the fixation device, proximal to the button mm. on that flat bit. Mm. Now I note he passed the graft underneath some side tissue, tissue mm. that's proximal to the epicondyle mm. and then fixed it Wasn't there. it intermuscular, wasn't it just going well, it was. He didn't, do, didn't remove that soft tissue, which is where the bleeding are, the three sisters, yeah. or whatever you call them. Um, the vessels that are near that area which can cause the bleeding. I wanted to ask him about the hematoma rate. <coughs> But I think we got better at doing it, getting less hematomas and bleeding, because that is a problem of tenodesis. Mm. What do you fix yours with? Oh. Well, I, yeah, I started off with a staple because that's how we were taught and that's how it had to fit in with the stability study. Yeah. Um, and then I started using um, an anchor. It was actually a helicoil anchor with Smith & Nephew helicoil anchor, just because we had them on the shelf, because the, yeah. that's what the shoulder guys use. Um, and then... After probably six months of Tim whinging at me that actually that was not good fixation and that there was concerns about it, and every time he came into theatre because we were often operating on the de same day, he would tut. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> his tuts, his tuts yeah, are quite powerful, aren't they? Well, annoying. More yeah. Than, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they yeah. finally get to you. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh right, so it I'll breaks you down. Back, I'll go back to a staple. So I have actually gone full circle okay. back to a staple again. What you said? So I, I started with staple as we all did. And I, I saw one of Pete's videos years ago, and I've, so I've always put it horizontally. But you've got to then make quite a big cut to get the length to get yep. a long way away oh, from, yeah. your, from your fixation. So I then moved to an anchor. So I've started using just a, a soft tissue all suture anchor. Okay. Uh, so it, it put it in, it makes a ball, and you can't pull it out. Yeah. But I do decorticate or roughen down the bone just right. distal to that, so it doesn't affect the anchor pull out strength. Yeah. But there's bleeding bone, and when I've fixed it, I stitch the graft to the surrounding soft tissues, or so you can't do it two or three fixations there. Yeah. But I always do it after, because you're drilling a tiny little wire through. <clears throat> so I drill my ACL tunnels or revision ACL tunnels, and then I don't put the graft through. I fix my tenodesis then, right. and I fix the tenodesis, and then I feel the knee. So I know how much my tenodesis is contributing to stability. And often you find the lapman's gone and the pivot's gone, yeah. and then you put your ACL in. So you really know how much your yeah. contribution you get from both. Yeah. So yeah. does that mean you can just do a lateral tenodesis on someone who's slightly lax? from either a partial well, that's ACL That's what they did in the old days. Or a got, failing. I've got, I've got a case to ask about when we've finished. I just don't think, it's, I don't think it, it, can't, it can't make up for a badly done ACL. Mm -hmm. I think you've still got to have a good functioning ACL. They've got, they work together mm -hmm. rather, rather than getting out from a... From it's a interesting person. you do that way around because I, 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 I always fix it at the end. Do the ACL, finish that, and then do the tendesis at the end. And I use a 3.5 twin fix. Mm -hmm. How about you, Henry? Well, I don't fix anything to the femur at all. I do what Peter Meyer showed me, which was, is to loop the 
a piece of ITB around the LCL and stitch it back on itself. Yeah. Now, if the, the control is the thickening of the lateral capsule, then it's, that is exactly what you've recreated. Yeah. And it is a really nice thing to do, is to have a look at the control of the internal rotation as you, once you do that, and you've got this lovely thick bit of tissue. Now, I've done that because I think that I don't like the fixation bit on the femur because I think there's some comorbidity with that, whether it be to your ACL tunnel or something needs taken out. But when I ask around and people use suture anchor staples, it, ma it makes me wonder whether or not that is that important because I can't believe that suture anchors actually stay in for very long. So, I mean, the one thing I am impressed with the stability study is yeah, it's, it's very impressive, but I think this, uh, having the surgical technique uh, standardized was such a good thing to do. And, and that was all staple? It was all staple, but also, yeah, and the sort of slight counter thing to just looping it around the LCL is actually the fibres that you're trying to really recreate as that reflection of fibres off the deep surface of the IT band onto the femur, which is all a bit more proximal, the aversian, yeah. aversian fibres, isn't it? That, that um, there's a few nice uh, anatomical dissections that, that get shown at, at talks. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It was good but, to see the technique, though, that he was... Mm. Yeah. So can I just go off a slight tangent go while I think of it of a case that I wanted to ask you about, really picking up on what you said about what can a lateral tenodesis... Mm. Um, uh, control. Uh, control, exactly, yeah. H how much can you rely on it, really? So had two cases yesterday in meniscal reconstruction clinic. Uh, previous ACL reconstructions, both cases exactly the same, normal alignment... Um, referred for consideration of lateral meniscal transplant, complete lost lateral um, meniscus. Both had ACL reconstructions done in the past, um, hamstring grafts, both intact, but both with a definite pivot, a gr only a grade one pivot, okay, but definite difference to the other side. In clinic, as opposed to EUA? In clinic, um, and grade one Lachman as well, okay, so a graft intact, but not entirely stable from the ACL. Now, if you're then adding in a lateral meniscal transplant to that, are you helping stabilize the lateral side of the knee because the meniscus is going to contribute a little way? Um, or are you worried that the meniscus will fail because you haven't got full stability of the knee? And do you add in a revision ACL reconstruction when actually you've got a pretty reasonable result from your ACL reconstruction in the first place, or can you get away with your lateral meniscal transplant plus a lateral tenodesis? Nice easy question, Pete. I'll start with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long I'm, day. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> sitting... <laughs> 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 that's a, that's a, it must be a common scenario. It is, it is a common scenario, a common scenario. and I rationalise that, that if it's a well-orientated ACL and the patient is not getting instability feeling, then leave it and just put in the meniscus because it will bulk up that lateral side and add to it. And I'm sitting, it, I'm sitting here thinking, grade one Lapman sounds pretty good. Well, so if it's a poorly, if it's a poor ACL, <laughs> or an old ACL that is vertical and yeah. the patient doesn't like the instability examination, I really believe you can always get a pivot, 99% of the time, a, a good pivot test in clinic, and we rely on that a lot in the awake patient, not in the yeah. sleep patient. Mm. We should be able to examine and keep examining, get them to relax and to know that that's the feeling they don't like. And if they've got no instability feeling, then don't need to redo the ACL. But it is a very, uh, in the clinic, it's a real dilemma, but that's how we've rationalized it. If the ACL is functional, good position, leave it. If it's high and bad and they really don't like the rotation test, okay. then there's often an easy revision anyway because it's not a bad, it's a bad tunnel, so yeah. it becomes an easier revision because you can't leave them unstable. But will, will your lateral tenodesis actually um, well, now, there's an prevent, thing that prevent the rotation? If you're doing a revision ACL but and a meniscus transplant, maybe not add a tenodesis in because the no, I'm talking theoretical about the other risk way. of over-constraining the lateral side. So just do an ACL... Now I'm talking about doing it the other way. Leave the ACL, accept that there's a little bit of lax in the ACL, and, and just do the yeah, tenodesis with your meniscus. If you're using a suture anchor or it's a quite a thin bit of tissue and you're relying on that for control, it's going to fail, isn't it? It's an augment. It's not going to control the rotation on its own. Well, is it, though, because it, it, it worked for lots of people in the 1970s and 80s. It was a thick bit of tissue then, not well, a tiny little strand. Well, to take a thicker piece yeah. of yeah. tissue there. there was yeah. a stable. It was a great grade one pivot they had. Yeah. So if, yeah, if, you, if you're medial, medial, medial meniscus deficient, you will get a little bit of a lap. If you're lateral meniscus, you will get a little bit of pivot. You'll, it stops that. You will get a pivot glide. 
with lateral meniscal defects. So I would probably just go transplant and see how they do. One of the cases was an easy decision because he was a professional squash player playing four times a week and didn't have any symptoms other than a bit of aching after playing. Right. I thought, hmm, you probably don't need this, actually. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be all right. Yeah. No, but listen, there was a, but we saw a video today. I can't, maybe it was Peter, I remember. Somebody did a lateral tenodesis on its own and got rid of the pivot shift before they did their ACO. Who was that? Yeah, that was, well, was Robbo. Yeah. Robbo. So that, yeah. would, that would suggest that it was Robbo. Uh, that's, 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 that's zero. Time zero, that's time zero yeah. in theatre, that's and is it going to yeah. stretch out? But if you're adding in the meniscus as well, which gives some extra stability, maybe, yeah. you know, maybe it's enough. Mm. Anyway. So can I move it on? I want to ask about, um, there appears to be an evol evolution in uh, opening wedge medial tibial osteotomy. In as much that we always used to aim for the Fujisawa point, and now people seem to be tipping them less laterally and coming more for a neutral alignment. Is that fair? Mm, no. Yes. I think Chris was saying, Chris Wilson, was it, who was speaking? What, aiming for 50% if you're doing an opening wedge medial for varus knee? Yeah. Adult, Not 50%, Adult. but Fujisawa's point is... 62. Six, yeah, so... 67, actually. Yeah, 66.6. Yeah, it's what he actually described, yeah. but it got... It gets... I think, what, well, I think what Chris was trying to say was you don't have a fixed point, you have a, a variable point and you tailor it for what you're doing to that patient. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I, look, I remember that UCOR picture and I kind of aim for the green smiley faces, you know, around the lateral tibial spine. So, but um, he did say that he, they're, they're getting less and less lateral and he's getting more and more neutral. And that does seem to be um, an evolving philosophy. Did, did he say that or was that one of the questions? No, he said that. He did say that. It was more about doing a uni afterwards, wasn't it? Well, that was a question, because yeah. I was yeah. moderating that a bit. That yeah. was a question yeah. that came from the audience. Uh, from, from from the do, do you guys virtual. scope your osteotomies beforehand or not? Yeah. So I, I do routine that, and sometimes if you find that they're grade three, you know, more worse than you wanted to be, I maybe won't bring them over as much, yeah. uh, accepting it may not last quite as long. Yeah. Uh, if the patient accepts that, and then you can, uh, you've not burnt your bridges, they need to do something else on the medial side afterwards. So. Uh, yeah, I think it's a cosmetic thing as well, though, because actually if you, if you look at some of the osteotomy data and when you go to the osteotomy meetings they say that um, there's not a lot of clinical difference like your green smiley face mm. bit so you've got this you've got this um, target that you're aiming for and it doesn't matter if you're a bit more valgus or perhaps a bit neutral they're still happy mm. in terms of outcome of pain but patients don't like to be too valgus. I, I agree with you, know, you, if you if you try and go just on the down slope of the lateral yeah. tibial spine and you overcook it it looks ugly they, and, uh, you know, and sometimes you very occasionally, you, you know, you take the tourniquet off of the drain, you think, mm. that looks mm. a bit yeah. much, you know, and people don't like it at mm. all. Mm. So surely <clears throat> aim at the lateral tibial spine or just medial to it, a millimetre or two medial mm. to it, and then if you overcook it, you're still happy. If you underdo it, you're still You're happy. in that green yeah. zone. You're still in the green yeah. zone. Yeah. So that's where I've sort of come yeah. to with osteotomy. It's, it's less like better under undercooking than overcooking, I think. Yeah. Mm. To the top of the top of the spine. Yeah. yeah. I aim for the top of the spine the most, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so not as far as Fujisawa and no. we're talking less than a point, it's more of almost a corridor of yeah. acceptability. Uncertainty. Uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> Outside the off stump. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but it's, it's <laughs> frustrating if you actually measure your corrections afterwards and against your attended that yeah. intended that's not very re rewarding. <laughs> Why would you do that? Because Ruin the operation. And, and the <laughs> in, inaccuracy in the long leg alignment x-rays and getting them physically taken. Yeah. And then in the measurement and then in our process of doing it. So um, that's not a satisfying... You don't use the diaphragm cable on the table, do you? Bushman's no, navigation. No. That's I'm called still in... That's, that's the most accurate <laughs> thing I've ever it. seen. Bushman's I'm still in favour of using a rod, yeah. x-ray rod, rather than totally relying on pre-plan because of fear of this miss of the rocking point. I know we didn't really discuss planning today, but I'm worried about this overcorrection by missing the, the tipping point where you rock over. But the tipping points, that, that's more about whether there's um, bone erosion or yes. ligament laxity. If you miss it. Yeah, whereas like most osteo, you'll know that before from your x-rays, surely. So when you talk, well, I spoke to Matt Dawson about that some time ago, and they've sort of gone off the tipping point a bit, haven't they? Are they? But Planning, you plan on computer and then do that exact nine millimeters or whatever it is. Mm. You, you've got, you've got to t if you've got lateral laxity, you've got to take that into account. Yes. So, so I tend to but measure both it. sides, and if you're two mils extra gapping on this side than the opposite side, I take two degrees off. It's not scientific, but you've got to account for soft tissue laxity when you. So I, I will yes. work out a plan 
make some adjustments and then just and then I just stick to it and once I've decided that before and I'll oh, just take this wedge this thickness yeah same here I, I don't yeah. try and measure it interruptively and I just find the even the rods to be unreliable takes so. time mm. yeah are you a um, a rod man rodder <laughs> <laughs> no I think I think Traumacad is is somebody made no. the point today that Traumacad they should all be planned on Traumacad and I agree with yeah. that entirely because it, it means that you don't fall into the trap of yeah. getting that increased joint obliquity and I think that's really important um, and secondly I think if you do plan it on Traumacad and you measure very carefully the base of your wedge and you've you've prepared it all I think you can get very accurate results and you know you do the long leg alignment x-rays post optively and you'll find if you do that you're never more than a few millimeters either side out and that's worked for me mm. we've just had that sectra installed have you guys used sectra yes we've got sectra facts uh, so for the osteotomies you just say put the do the long leg it goes to your middle of your femoral, femoral head middle of your tail. it does it all for Walks you, you click it. the click yeah takes 30 seconds and then you say right i want these my osteotomy line i want a middle opening here it, it correct, draws the lines as you're doing it. Yeah. So right, I want to stop there. I want to do a closing wedge distal femoral as well on the same patient, and it does that on for you. So will it spot the lateral opening? Uh, no, it won't do that. You have to. You've got to. It, you've yeah. got you to, have to spot it. You put the joint. But it can really give you. You get a visual of the joint line with numbers parameters on immediately. And it so saves it. It's really powerful. So the, but the best tip for me from Matt Dawson today was understanding this bending the femoral plate. And I'd sort of heard this in the wings before and didn't realise that it uh, actually mm. what they do. To make the femoral plate for the sit closing nicely. wedge medial. Distal femoral. Sit. Distal yeah. femoral. Mm. Bend the plate. Yeah. I thought I was in the wrong place, you know, when it wasn't fitting <laughs> correct. It was yeah. me. Yeah. You're Matt's told. talk was great. He does speak well, actually. Yeah. I learned a lot from that, actually. Yeah. He um, listed his, point after his, point. His um, type 2 fracture, that, that concerned me a bit. Because I must admit, I've been a little bit... You're talking about the hinge fracture? Hinge fracture, yeah. yeah. So the type 2 hinge fracture. Um, just a bit, I don't know, uh, ignorant to that, thinking, well, it'll be all right. I'm not yeah. really but I think it depends on what sort of plate you've you... got away with it. Well, to Tomafix plate. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the Tomafix plate, the data shows that, that those Takuchi 2 fractures, you can, you can fully weight bear them because the construct is so strong that actually it's fine. But I think some of these newer anatomical plates... I'm not sure the data is there to back that up. So I think that may be what he's talk talking about. I mean, certainly the Tomafix plate for, for me, which I continue to use, you know, it feels so strong that I, I don't worry about it's that. It's a big old plate, though. If you identify one, then, in clinic, because they're often not apparent intraoperatively, you don't know. Absolutely, you don't. You're like, yeah. uh, yes, six weeks or whatever follow-up, and you see on the X-ray, What do you do anything about it? No, just, you just you're just aware of it and yeah. you tell the patient and say, look, you just need to go easy and we'll, we'll, we'll follow you up more but, regularly. But it's interesting because mm. that, that golden screw on the Tomafix is supposed to reduce and compress and allow for that. Mm. Uh, even if you have a fracture, they, they claim, J&J, mm. uh, that you can just go with it. I think that, that hinge wire that they showed really is quite... Particularly on the distal femorals. For the, yeah. yeah, for the yeah. closing. It's just yeah. brilliant, yeah. yeah. I haven't used that yet, but that's, that, so that was a good learning point. Yeah, it? definitely. Yeah. There you go. The, the other learning point I got from Matt was on his um, rotational osteotomies. I know that's not very common, mm. but he, he, he showed, yeah, doing a just distal to tubercle um, proximal tibial rotational osteotomy and using the Hoffman X fix. X fix, yeah. And it was a, he, I was talking with a protractor. It yeah, it, it was a, it was the upper limb ones. So they're quite small pins. They're three point five millimeter pins, yeah. mm. not which I think is upper limb. Yeah. Not that I've done trauma for years, but he put those in, and then. He, Change the rotation, then put a bar on and holds it in place while you do your plate. How clever Very is that? Clever, isn't it? Yeah, it's all out the way, makes it easier. I also learned Why from can't that you that. just put a Steinman pin through and hold it? Yeah, you could. Because you've got your two wire, you've got your two pins from your but Hoffman, you put them in line, and then you just put your bar on. But, uh, but he, the right. thing that was nice about the Hoffman pins Perfect. being off, off axis, Pete, was the fact that you use a protractor. So there's yeah, your 30 yeah. degrees. Oh, right. Right. Now you know it's 30 degrees, so you yeah. know you've done it exactly to your plan. Sure. sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing I learned from him was I need to wear more waistcoats. <laughs> Every time I go to a, a session on biologics in the knee, uh, perhaps it's just me, but I leave overwhelmed and none the wiser. There's, um, so Scott Rodeo gave a very comprehensive talk. There's a ton of pathways, a ton of places to, to um, act. And, but whenever, every time I go to a biologic session, I feel like I've been drinking from a fire hydrant. Um, yeah. What's what? that like? Yeah, overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it. So, I mean, what, 
what should we be injecting for your middle-aged patient with some degenerative knee symptomatic osteoarthritis? Steroid. Um, but, they, but they tell us that's the one thing we shouldn't be injecting. Yeah. That, uh, no, one, that, one off steroid is, is fine. Two steroids, fine. I think there is evidence that more, more than more steroids, the exact number is not known, can harm articular cartilage. Also stops working. Uh, I think... It's a law of diminishing returns, isn't it? I find. Yes. Yeah. So then we want something more. And the, um, that, I thought that talk was really nicely putting the evidence and playing down there is too much marketing on it. And, but there was some good science and some pointers that we need to do more. And your question to them about where will we be in five, ten years' time was very, was very good. So I, I've personally jumped off and started using the, the, the Enstride uh, product, that type of almost not quite second-generation PRP. They don't like it when you call it that, and it's not quite that. It's another... <coughs> Um, a product, and that seems to be you produce some clinical benefits from it. So I've been quietly impressed by that as a strategy for some some patients. But we need more data, and we need to be in trials and the registry stuff to put the information in there to monitor these outcomes. Mm. So there's something there. There's a huge lot of science behind it, um, to, but to make it clinically beneficial mm. is the bit we're missing, and not this this bad um, the worry of the marketing and the mm. dropping in the word stem cells he made some very good mm. comments on that you yeah, can't call it stem good. cells but equally he gave a fantastic rundown of the evidence and literature but you know there was a several times he goes well here's a really good study one of them was from Spain yeah. randomised study yeah. really nicely done study and I was thinking here we go 15 patients in each arm mm. that's like, the problem with a lot know, of the studies yeah. how, what, what are we really yeah. going to do with that yeah. what are you injecting uh, right, so early OA, so yeah. if it's bone on bone and they're not... No, I'm talking about Calgary and Lawrence 2, 3... So if and it, I, I'm a big fan of HA. Yeah. Yeah. So high molecular weight, the HA. Duralane. Duralane. Mm. Yes. And the, the mixture of steroid plus HA. Yeah, I tried that and I didn't, it didn't seem to be that effective. Right. So I've gone back, I used to use Duralane a lot and I've gone back to it now and the patient seemed much happier with it for that earlier early patient, early away, and it, symptomatic. And if it's three, version on four, does that change for you? In, t in what time period? In Kelvin Lawrence. Oh, three uh, on four. I think once, you, once four. you get to four, you know, if they've not got an effusion, then I don't think there's... You know, so, uh, HA is anti-inflammatory, isn't that? It mops up all the interleukins, interleukin-6, obviously. If you've not got any active inflammatory process going on, I don't think it's going to do much. Is it not cleared from the joint within about 48 hours, though? Uh, so three months, for it, the bigger one's three months, uh, but the effects of the interleukin mopping up last a lot longer than how long it's in the knee. And is that part of a package of conservative treatment, including weight loss, physiotherapy? 100%. I reckon they're, it's all small gains, yeah. but together there's quite a synergistic effect. Mm. You know, yeah. Offloading brace, yeah. weight loss, physiotherapy, strengthening, conditioning. But they they all... Sorry, after you say your, um, does, does your NHS hospital allow you to use it? No. I was, I was done that. The companies pay for it? Yes. Uh, no, some, once, some of them, once, some of them. Once yeah. they pay one. But a lot of the patients will often just, just decide they want it themselves. Yeah. And Henry, are you putting steroid in anyone's knees? Yeah, I think steroids are very useful. I, I, I call it breaking the cycle of pain, and that's often the problem with patients, is breaking the cycle of pain to allow them to do... They go and see the physiotherapist and they come back and say, it hurts, I can't do it. Mm. You break the cycle of pain, then they can do it. And uh, I, I agree um, with Tim entirely. I think one, absolutely fine, two is probably okay. And I say to the patient at two, right, we need to think about Arthur doing Arthur. something else now, mm -hmm. and whether that be, you know, osteotomy or yeah. w w whatever. But I, I, th I think it, ha it, it has a role. It, it works very well. It's instant. Um, and then I also use HA, just, just the indications you've said. I, th I think it's helpful. Um, and, you know, these things are reasonably cheap low morbidity and I, I think the patients are you know you're, do, you're doing them a favor and whether that is a sort of placebo effect as part of the other things they're doing does does that matter if you're making them better are you injecting prp in anyone i've injected so it. are you injecting placebo uh, <laughs> i've done probably six in my career and they've all been patients have come to me and said please can you um uh, inject PRP into my knee I've been through the evidence with them and if they're happy to pay for it and they want to try it I think the evidence is strong enough to actually offer it but I don't ever mention it. it yeah no How you, uh, I don't I don't think I don't think the evidence is strong enough with those I think uh, it's like a lot of the level one RCTs look great but they've got n equals 15 in them mm -hmm. so the power when you look at the power calculations not that they've done them but they, they've used some funny stats and it, it's essentially like you know, tossing a coin Instead of 50% chance, it's 52% chance. So the power 
is pretty low with those things. So, we, so you're going to need more numbers in those groups. Aren't yeah. you? We've got um, Professor Becky Kearney here in um, Warwick University, who's part of the clinical trials unit. She's a physio. Um, she's a really bright cookie. And she was up in Aberdeen at the BOA uh, presenting the results of the PRP injections for Achilles tendinopathy. Mm. And um, oh, fantastic. They do really good clinical trials here as part of Warwick University. And yet, absolutely no evidence. And she, she said, as part of this, they've looked at the literature for PRP injections, and there is no evidence that it makes any difference for any orthopaedic condition, was her take on it, which well, was interesting. That's not what we heard today. I thought that was a, today was a very good breakdown of the evidence presented. Yeah, it seems I to have I different effects that. in different parts of the body, though. I think it's, you know, it's not just that this, it works and everything. It works, yeah. Maybe it works better for tennis elbow and, and not so yeah. well for patellar tendinopathy. So we discussed patellar tendinopathy, yeah. and now I was hoping there would be finally a solution. No, we didn't. He was saying it wasn't that, wasn't that good. It was um, maybe multi, multi, leukocyte rich in patellar tendinopathy. May be good, but it's not. The evidence isn't clear there. Because I thought that would be hopeful that we mm. could do PR, PRP, but it's not there really. The evidence to do that. Very funny. One of my friends did a talk. He's a foot ankle surgeon. His talk was the role of PRP in Achilles tendinopathy. You know, the, the list of treatments for debridement, arthroscopy, all this other stuff, and PRP was right at the bottom, just above joystick therapy. <laughs> just wave two joysticks around. It's just maybe marginally better than that. <laughs> yeah, um, I might have to watch that talk again, just on half speed. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there was a slow the fire hydrant there. down by yeah. half. <laughs> slow the tap down. But he's, he said, right, in ACL reconstructions, not enough evidence there to be doing it, to, <clears throat> to improve appearance of the graft or something. So that's, yeah. that's good. I learned that. Um, patella tendon may be in the... Could possibly measure that? Well, if you get an MRI at six months and the blackness of a, of a graft, that's the... That was a claim I've heard that you get a more blacker, therefore healthier looking ACL graft at six months if you've mm. um, dipped in. I've had a few patients come over for, for here from the States and they've said they had an ACL with PRP. Well, yeah, or, they, or they harvest it. away yeah. 500 extra dollars onto the yeah. operation bill. And, and some people harvest it and just bathe it in PRP as yeah. it sits there. Yeah. It's called um. reaming. <laughs> <laughs> you come back in when you put the look, it's a wash in the air, it's full of blood, isn't it? No, so that was a fantastic. All, all what you want to know now yeah. in, that, in that talk. Yeah, yeah he this was really is, yeah. good. So there's this group, the Biologics Association, which is trying to tie together all the societies and keep that science together. So bits of from Academy, yeah. mm. AOSSM, trying to, and ICRS, trying to put the brains together to try and mm. keep it scientific. And the challenge is which products and when to actually start to use these things, mm. and if they're available, not too expensive. Mm. So I think it's definitely something of the future. I know in our bit last night, Biologics didn't star as a future thing, but I think there's definitely... Yeah, yeah, there is. I mean, there, of course, there is. Have to it's it's got to be scientifically it. driven, though, that's the thing. Yeah. Yes. Not, not marketing fully, driven. Yeah. No, I'm glad I didn't feature last night, otherwise I couldn't have won the prize. I was wondering how long it takes to mention that. Just, You've got at least half an hour for me. Are we editing this bit out? Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought Henry did very well, and Henry was a runner up. We, yeah, of course, yeah. we had no. Piss off. We actually, <laughs> actually we we only had, voted for you because yeah. we were, felt sorry, sorry for, for me, you. Yeah. You've got but, rehabbed. Tim, you mentioned ICRS. You are, you are our Mr. Cartilage. Uh, Martin Snow talked about using codon for cartilage repair of cartilage defects. Yeah. Uh, John Salzman from Vienna gave a quite impressive talk about using minced cartilage. Can you just tell us your algorithm for managing cartilage defects? Leave them alone. <laughs> Put in a meniscus. <laughs> I'm talking, let's say it's medial Sorry, femoral, medial femoral condyle, weight bearing code, <laughs> just cartilage. What would be your algorithm? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, some of our algorithm is driven by what is available, mm. not by what I'd sort of like to do. So I'd like to keep it pragmatic as to what, by what we're allowed to do. So I'm a believer in cell-based products. I was early in the game of the Genzyme ACI cartilage repair, and then that's rather been taken away from us by NICE. It's been approved, but the companies went out of business in waiting for that approval. Yeah. So now it's very hard to do a cell-based treatment. And it's great that Martin has pushed on with that and showed some pretty impressive data. Those little cells. Mm. The spheres. The spheres, spherons. Impressive, the before and after from those small little things. So I've seen that over the last few years, and it is, does seem to be impressive if you're doing cell treatment. But I'm also quite excited by, the, by what John Salzman was doing. We were involved in the early the case study, the CAIS bit of micronized um, articular cartilage. Mm -hmm. that just didn't, 
it was published in America, or the European arm of the trial didn't really go anywhere. But that, um, the, the science behind it is good on that. And that was, that, that was impressive as well. If that's all you need to do, shave away a bit of cartilage, put it in, mm. and that's impressive. If, uh, so there's a lot of that going on in Europe, and that was why we wanted him to present. What do you do? Data was good. 15 by 10 millimeter. Small defects, if I can do two oats plugs, mm -hmm. two eight millimeter oats, do that rather okay. than microfracture. So you do microfracture at all? Uh, no, one or two bone marrow stimulation holes mm. for a very small defect. That is microfracture, isn't it? Uh, yes, but I'm not calling it the word microfracture. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Stimulate with a wire and yeah. drill nano, for nano a... fracture. And I believe in nano fracture rather than the yeah, true right. microfracture yeah. because that makes more parallel sided. So holes. you do not do isolated microfracture? No. For chondral defect? And if it can do, if it's a less than two square centimetre defect, then I would prefer oats. Okay. Two, <coughs> maximum two plugs. Two eights is easier than two tens because mm -hmm. it's easier to get it sitting right. Mm -hmm. And then more than two square centimetres, then we have a, a problem as to what to what to do for that. We're getting into osteochondral allograft. Mm. So we've done, despite what was being said today, we've done 40 of those. We've, we get the funding to do it. And then so far, there's probably one failing at a year, not really not happy, that's not doing very well. The others, it's as the Americans said today, doing, doing well. Yeah. A part of those, um, seven or eight of those are with meniscus transplant. So that's a problem we're dealing with a really poor joint. Mm. And in and failing to, joint, yeah, failing joint. So I think really think the osteochondral allograft is a way ahead. I don't have a good solution for the four square centimeter. I would refer them to Martin if they looked perfect isolated lesion. Mm. And if they're over forty five, then we're heading for the epicerf. It was interesting what Brian Cole said that he will oft, he'll sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, forty five is young. It's getting old, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's mean. <laughs> that's mean about a month. Um, Brian Cole talked about... No, it's not, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Brian Cole was talking about no, using... He said 45. Born, <laughs> not, 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 born uh, in 45. Born in 45, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you want to, just after the war. Brian Cole talked about using osteochondral... He, he actually was interesting. He said it will sometimes his preference is go to osteochondral allograft for cartilage defects because he thinks that's a reliable graft in his hand. Yes. That was quite interesting, I thought. There's, above cell-based therapies... Yeah, for his sort of almost his go-to solution. Yeah. What did you think of that, given that you do both? They've got the supply of allograft, and that's, that's impressive that it does take. You have replaced the proper articular surface. Mm -hmm. And there's this argument... saying this high lung cartilage. I'm going yeah. to wait a year. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just chondral. Yeah. It's a bone, yeah. it's the bone unit. cartilage yeah. unit. So you're replacing it all. And if it's this shell, not a shell, it's a five, six millimeter, eight, maximum eight millimeter depth, mm. two or three of articular cartilage, five, therefore, of bone. So you've got a small volume of bone to, rip, to um, creeping substitution. And if you've really washed it out, and that's a key bit. Now, he was dipping it in BMAC. Mm. Um, and I think the evidence on that, I'm, I've, my reading is that that's not clear that it is important to put a graft into um, some form of stimulation to make it yeah. happen. The, the end of the femur's got quite good stimulation. It's we might drill, drill the base. If it's not obviously bleeding, then drill the base. Um, mm. Did you microfracture? I don't I've not done one for quite a few years now. So I, what I tell, if a cartilage is a small defect, I'll, I will... Stabilise the edges and curette the base. So just take that calcified layer off, yeah. and then I will get a curette. I don't microfracture. You know, where you do microfracture the notch for bleeding, I don't. Yeah. I just get a curette and just scrape, almost decorticate the small area, yeah. and that bleeds. And then I don't do anything to the subchondral bone. Interesting. It does burn some bridges. I think if you've got to go back. Yeah. We don't do as much of this work though anymore because we did so much arthroscopy like ten years ago, whereas nowadays most of the cartilage damage that we treat part and parcel of something else mm. like an mm. ACL or an instability or, of know, yeah. or a, I don't know, an osteotomy or a meniscal transplant I agree entirely we look at we them to completely do different. so much arthroscopy mm. oh there's yeah. a bit of damage on the cartilage let's do an arthroscopy mm. and then you were almost forcing the treatment mm. and that's why perhaps microfracture was was um, such a um, common option and, and popular yeah. option for people because you felt obliged to do something. I think just by stabilising it though has a big effect. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Knees so don't like bits of cartilage moving around. Right. So just, really? they, just you don't have to do yeah. into the base, but deprive the edge, make it stable. They will symptomatically get better. Mm -hmm. I think that's two chondral allografts are brilliant. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. I totally agree. I think it's, it's really, really um, so the, changed what we do. The plug now is to get NHSBT to supply osteochondral allografts. Mm -hmm. Now, politeness out the window, it's been five years we've been asking mm -hmm. them to do this, and I really don't understand, and I don't mind if this is live, because it's very frustrating. We want them to be able to provide fresh, less than 28 days of donation osteochondral allografts. And that's a big need for it. There is certainly a demand for it. And we have the model, we have the data. We've shown its cost effectiveness uh, from our uh, work. And we need that, that work. We've tried to link JRF Ortho to come and do a, like a franchise mm -hmm. in HSBT. And I keep asking, I wanted an update actually for this meeting. Um, to understand where we are with supply in this country, because that would help. <coughs> where is the block? Because there are donors. People are, are dying. I don't, I don't know where the block is, really, because then we could maybe tackle it more. Whether it's, I don't think it's HTA licensing. Mm. I think it's something, there's a, there's a commercial side to it. There's getting it done. There's a process of getting the approvals of the processing and making sure the donors are cleared. Mm. Um, is it the everything facility, tied together? Is it the facility to get it as well? Because Sanchi's been over to to Denver, Denver you, Joint Operations, yeah. Wh where, oh, it's quite incredible. I always try and go and visit. If, and you should, if you use Allegro, you should go and visit the lab you got it from, because yes. you need to know where they come from. And it's probably one of the most eye-opening trips that we've been on, because mm. you you go along and, and they've got you know three bedded ICUs for people that are, who are brain dead, mm. but they keep them alive. Like an East tissue keeps them alive, so they're there. They get a CT scan to their chest, check the lungs. If the lungs are okay, then go for transplant check the kidneys out, they don't wash their skin, if they've been an RTA, they wash it in alcohol so they don't, they don't use water so you can get dermalograft. It's incredible the setup and it's, it's and we asked them over there, we had a tour of their labs and they're, they're so finicky about infection so they get 50 swabs in the room every day. If there's one positive swab, the place shuts down. Yes. And you take this swab into theatre and we've got people walking in and out. <laughs> Yeah, and it gets an infection, and they, they, they're, they're so paranoid about providing... Acceptance. But Tim's right, though. If we can get an increased um, availability of Oshikon or Allograft, it's a game-changer for, for joint preservation for us. There's so many things to get into place for that, from the yeah. preparation of it, the licensing, the supply chain, the sizing. That's what we need to help with, too. Now, as knee surgeons, we should be working with our tissue bank, because we need that tissue, um, from balancing what we need and what they can then provide. So I think there's a move that we should be engaging with the tissue bank. The one last thing I want to talk about, uh, meniscus repair, Sanj, that was your session. S save the meniscus, save the world. Um, You've changed your tune. You were saying rehab was the best thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was, you didn't uh, say that yesterday. I was given a topic, and you, you, in a debate you go to what you, what you dealt with. Um, <laughs> any, tips for, any tips for accessing the posterior route for a medial meniscal root tear? So it can be really quite tight in there. It can be tight, and there are proponents for MCL releases, so you can do percutaneous. We saw a couple of videos today. You can do a POL or, or, deep, or superficial MCL release. How you I do actually your MCL don't. Release? I actually don't do hardly, and I've done one, I think, in total. Okay. Um, when we were doing the old act fits years ago. Mm. Um, so to get to the posterior route, to be honest with you, you can get through it from the front. You don't need to have the knee in valgus. You can get to it in 60 centimetres of flexion. Yeah. A little bit of varus. Varus pushing against the table really opens works, up yeah. that gap, and you can put your scope in there and your instruments to get to that route quite yeah. easily. So I'd, I'd, I don't do MCL releases, but there's plenty of data to suggest that you can do them pretty safely without having any issues. Do you do? Uh, yeah. How do you do it? We, we use a white needle yeah. and pie crust it um, with the tension on the knee. Femoral uh, at the top end? Yeah, yeah, at the level of the joint line. Yeah. And, um, but I don't have to do it that often. I mean, I've probably done it maybe a dozen times. Yeah. Um, but I, I agree with you, you know, getting through to the back, you can get from the front. Yeah. And actually, I'm quite happy to debride a little bit of PCL yeah. because it's a big ligament and missing a few fibres there is not a big problem for it. And actually, Seth Sherman was showing today, he's shaving a bit of the medial... The reverse notch yep. plaster. Yep. Yeah, and actually, I think I've always worried about damaging that, but it doesn't really do anything that bit, does it? So actually, d taking yeah. a little bit of that away is probably fine too. Yeah. But you chaps do meniscus transplants, must be doing releases all the time to get into the medial compartment. Yes, no, we do to get that for the stitching. Can you just describe the technique? Yeah, as, as Henry said, so at the level of the joint, the white needle in a horizontal fashion, so it's one, one pass in the skin and then you're into the joint right. and just carefully moving it uh, backwards and forwards. It's almost like a little knife. 
So at the level of the joint, you're... At the level, so it's below the, almost below the meniscus. Mm -hmm. So you see the needle come through um, below the meniscus into the joint. Mm -hmm. And then just, just withdrawing enough to go out through the capsule. Not the skin. And then move it, but not the skin, not multiple passes mm -hmm. through the skin. I think that will create a hematoma. Mm -hmm. Right. Or that will create some potential nerve damage in that area. So it's just once once in the skin and then you keep angling it backwards and forwards. But as was mentioned, it is almost the posterior fibers that suddenly make it release with the leg in extension. And you're putting quite a bit of valgus on it as you're doing it. <clears throat> yes, leaning against it and you feel it start to go. Now, I tend to stop before, before you think you've got enough exposure because as the operation goes on, it just seems to open one more millimeter. Yeah. So avoiding the, the crunch moment mm -hmm. so you just it's starting to open and you know it's there nearly enough and then just stop because as you do more leaning on it slowly it just seems to get the extra vital millimeter for seeing the meniscus james Robson has a nice video for if you're doing an acl reconstruction you take the hamstrings your distal superficial stem cells just there in front of you yeah. and you can put in valgus and just pie crust the posterior fibers that and that, that can open up the knee quite nicely and we're, we're fine i'm i'm just finding that there's an increased number of uh, medial meniscal root repair root tears people in their 50s, with a bit of degeneration. I've seen a few of them recently. Um, do you guys have an age, cut, age cut-off for doing a root repair? My age plus one. <laughs> yeah, uh, that tends to be the case. It keeps going up, yeah. yeah. Every year, you go, actually, 45 sounds quite young now. Yeah. Like many things, it's not about age, it's about the, what the joint looks like. And yeah. It's about the quality of the meniscal tissue and then the techniques. I learned quite a bit today about how you might improve our root tears. I mean, the issue with root tears in that yeah, early 50, mid 50 population is actually the quality of the meniscal tissue to get your sutures yeah. to hold. And actually there's some techniques that were shown quite nicely today about how you might improve that. I think it's not so much about the age of the patient, it's about the quality of the meniscus. It is just, right. it is a piece of string that you're putting in there, it? that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you've got to remember. So this so the natural meniscus that had its root attachment has become deficient and torn. Cash, my take on it is if the, if the joint's failing, mm -hmm. you can't save that. You know, and if the joint's yeah. failing, you know, for whatever reason, age, BMI, then putting the meniscus back ain't going to help. Fine, so you're going to your next step. I'm very them. down on root repair and degenerative knees. Yes. But surely the counter-argument to that is that it's more important to save the meniscus in that person. No, because it, it just it cannot control that amount of force, your root repair. It just can't. You're going to put your sutures in there. You pull hard enough, you'll pull them out. When that patient goes walking on that, it, your repair is not going to heal, is it? Is there a paper that says, here is a series of 50 <coughs> root repairs before and after, mm. before and after, no. all looking great? No. No. And, and the MRI the... can be disappointing if you dare to take one. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So there's still some extrusion, but clinically they're better but if the, there's a normal meniscus. The, Tim, the two papers in the AJSM on root repair recently, they've compared root repair with a match group of patients that have not had repair. Now, one of the things that I was interested in, the methodology, is they put the patient on crutches six weeks post-root yeah. repair. Mm. Now, my treatment for a root tear and spontaneous osteonecrosis is to go on crutches. Mm. So they're looking at two treatments in one go and saying that it's the right. root repair that works. For me, the six weeks on crutches is the thing that makes the patient better. Because I, so, I think they do, because when the contact pressures change, and that whole medial femoral yeah. condyle has got to do all that loading. It's got to heal, and six weeks on crutches is perfect for that to heal. Yeah, it's a meniscus in that compartment, in that knee, in that patient. Mm -hmm. So if there's a failing knee and a malaligned leg, it's not going to not gonna do anything. And I, I always think with those, that the meniscus extrudes because the collagen relaxes and then tears. So it's extruded before it's torn. Mm. So when it tears, you only see the extrusion, but it's not always because it's torn. Part of because continuum. it's stretched. We all do new replacements. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they're all intact roots, but the meniscus is out here somewhere. Yeah. So they definitely stretch with the collagen relaxing. So the collagen's bad by the time you get there. We'll leave it on those wise words. Can, can, can I just come up with quotes of the day? Yeah, do quotes of the day. Because Seth Sherman, I mean, what a character. We love Seth. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so funny. So, the most enthusiastic man. He's always so enthusiastic. He's smiling, yeah. Or even more enthusiastic. I liked his background. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He got background yeah. of the day, too. So, yeah. his, his two quotes were, no before you go. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's applicable to all aspects of life, isn't it? Yeah. No, before you go. <laughs> Is that K-N-O-W or N-O? <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one was, if you can see, you can do. Yeah. That's another great one. If you can see, you can do. I think it was also Seth said once. I think Seth once said, hope is not a surgical plan. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. But the most, I mean, we've avoided or left the most contentious part of the day, though, right to the end of the podcast today, which was Bill Bugby's choice of music. I did want to ask him what particular mix that was, because I did like that. <laughs> Four, we had like five minutes of pounding see, house yeah, music. I could see you I really liked it. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly like the way it built up the crescendo, the little break as it came in, just as he implanted the osteochondral allograft. <laughs> it was a good time. Yeah. We haven't got time to talk about meniscus transplant. We'll have to come back another time for that, Tim. Um, thank you all for your time and input, chaps. Um, us, we'll, we'll wax some cruise ship meeting next year. Yeah. November 22. Yeah. And, and then. It's the Thursday and Friday, is it the 8th and 9th or 7th and 8th. Okay, and we'll be back for the Warwick Sports Knee meeting in uh, two years' time. And maybe something else before then. Ah, interesting. Can you tell us any more? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot going on. You've got cool. the Pratella Fremo Society. Yeah. You've got the Kids Knee meeting. That, that's going to be good next year. Thank that's you. a real focused yeah, meeting, that's and that's important good. because there's a lot. That was Actually, good. I have to go to the Pratella Fremo Society. You know, they, they took my subscription yesterday by direct debits, so and I have to go. Sanjay and I have got to get our teeth whitened before that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Awesome. Thanks, <laughs> on that note.